I'm happy to invite Fezavich Puntak for his first talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Th thanks, Fered and Nati, for uh, inviting me. Um, I've been in several um, uh, nano meetings, and I always enjoy it. Uh, it's always fun to kind of have a, a cross-disciplinary uh, interactions. Okay, and let's see if it uh, it works. Wait. Yeah, here we go. That's. That. Okay, so um, uh, so first, um, in my lab, um, uh, I'm sitting in the life science uh, uh, faculty, um, and I have both uh, a kind of an interdisciplinary group uh, using both uh, um, uh, experimental techniques and uh, mathematical modeling to understand the developmental patterning processes. And we're very much interested in understanding how organized pattern of differentiation emerge during development, right? And, and you know, one key aspect of, uh, you know, all these beautiful patterns that emerge during development, one key aspect that underlies these processes is the ability of cells to communicate with each other and to coordinate their cellular state and ce cellular fate uh, and so on. So. Um, basically what we do, we try to look at how cells communicate and how the properties of the signaling pathways, the signaling systems that um, are used during development, how basically they're optimized to do their, their uh, work, their function during these developmental processes. Now, um, so the story that I'm going to tell you today uh, talks about polarity. Uh, and before I start, I want to mention that this is really a, a great work uh, that uh, a, a work that was done by two great students. Uh, one is Olga Loza, who's here, uh, who was a PhD in my lab. He's, she's currently in Bar Ilan, and um, uh, and the other one is Itze Himskirk, who's a post currently a postdoc in uh, Rice, who is a physicist and did a lot of the quantitative analysis, so it was really a nice kind of collaboration uh, between these two that made this work. So, um, as you know, many of our tissues, uh, many of the tissues in our body are uh, basically planar tissues or epithelial tissues, right? The skin, uh, uh, the intestine, the, the uh, uh, blood vessels and so on. We're talking about two-dimensional or quasi-two-dimensional uh, uh, um, uh, tissues, usually epithelial, and uh, when you look at these tissues, right, there, there are certain directions that are associated with these uh, tissues, the, uh, in almost all our tissues, right? One direction is the up and down direction, which is called the apical basal polarity, right? But there's another direction, which is, called, uh, which is a direction in the plane of the tissue, and that direction is defined by a process called planar cell polarity, okay? So planar cell polarity is usually manifested by having hair-like structures uh, going into a certain direction. And we typically see that uh, it's not only that each cell has its own, has its own direction, uh, these cells are, the polarity of these cells is coordinated sometimes over very large distances, right? If you look at your hand, Right? You see that all your hairs are pointing in a certain direction, you know, from this part to this part. Right? So basically this is planar cell polarity. Right? This is a process uh, that I'm talking about. And I'm going to try to understand how this kind of polarity emerges during development. What is the mechanism that drives uh, this uh, symmetry breaking process? Now, planar cell polarity is essential um, for almost uh, any epithelial uh, tissue, okay? It, it involves many, okay, you see it in many developmental processes. Uh, you can see it, for example, in the, uh, looking at the uh, Drosophila wing. Drosophila is the fruit fly, okay? Having all these hairs pointing in a certain direction. You can see it on mouse fur. You can see it on human hair, right? Uh, not always we're talking about hair structures. It's sometimes 
we're talking about um, uh, cellular orientation. For example, if you look at the, this compound picture of compound I, you have these clusters of cells. They have a direction, and there's a midline here, and, and half of the, the cells above the midline are pointing in one direction, and the ones below the midline are point, pointing in the other direction. Right? So the point is that in all these situations, right, you have a certain direction in space. Okay, so, um, so how, do you, how does this kind of uh, 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 polarity is determined? Uh, over the years, through genetic manipulations, people have identified two signaling pathways that are associated with planar cell polarity. One is called the core pathway that involves proteins like Frizzled and Van Gogh. And the other one is called the fat daxus pathway, uh, which is the one that I'm going to focus on today. Okay, and uh, interestingly, oh, what's known, both, what uh, both of these pathways share is that these pathways involve membrane proteins uh, and involve uh, interaction uh, across the boundary between two types of proteins. So you get this heteromeric interactions between uh, fat and axis or between frizzle and vangle, right? Uh, fat and axis particularly are large protocadherents. Coherents are uh, these family of proteins that are known to mediate uh, adhesion between cells. These are actually huge uh, proto uh, protocadherents that are known to form these heteromeric interactions at the boundary. Now, if you do a mutation, uh, let's say in the fat gene in Drosophila, what you see is that instead of getting an organized pattern of hairs, you start getting disordered pattern of hairs, right? So this is how these uh, proteins were identified initially. Now, the other thing that we know about these proteins is that if you look at tissues that go, planar, that, that go through planar cell polarity, Okay, the, you can see that uh, these two proteins, fat and axis, okay, they tend to segregate into opposite sides of the cell, the apical, on the apical side. Okay, so fat goes to one side, axis goes to the other side, and then the next cell, axis fat, the next cell, axis fat, and so on. Right, so this is how also this uh, polarity is coordinated between cells, okay? Now, you know, one of the interesting questions, though, is that all these cells express both fat and axis, and initially, there is no uh, uh, th there is no bias of the the distribution of the, both of these uh, proteins uh, is is equivalent to each other, right? And and the question is, or the, one of the main questions in the field, is to understand how do you start with a situation um, where you have a uniform distribution of these molecules to a situation where you have this asymmetric distribution. Right? So once this asymmetric distribution is formed, then this serves as the cue for all the other planar cell polarity phenotypes or behaviors of these cells. Right? So this is what we're trying to understand. How do you get from, how do you break the symmetry from uniform distribution to asymmetric distribution? Okay, so to try to address this question, we decided to take a kind of a synthetic biology approach, okay, where we try to reconstitute this system in a cell culture that do not usually, or cells that do not usually express uh, these proteins and see how they behave. Okay, and particularly, Olga uh, cloned these two giant protocadherents. Uh, that was already a, a big task by itself because uh, the fat, um, she, she looked at the fat four and axis one. These are mammalian homologs of fat and axis. Okay, and FAT4 is something like 5,000 amino acids, right? It's gigantic. And so what she did, she cloned these genes, she fused fluorescent proteins, uh, green, uh, yellow fluorescent protein to FAT4, red fluorescent protein to, to DAXIS1, and then generated stable cell lines that express either one or the second or both of these proteins um, in HEC293 cells. Okay, and we also, um, put the DAXIS1 M cherry under an inducible promoter, that means that we can turn on the production of DAXIS1 and see what happens dynamically. Now, if you take cells that express DAXIS1 M cherry and FAT4 citrine, uh, 
and grow them together in an um, experiment we call co-culture, what you basically see is that you get this very strong accumulation at the contact, at the heteromeric junctions between the FAT4 and axis 1, but not, in the hom not at the homotypic junctions. Okay? So this strong yellow here corresponds to lots of red fluorescent proteins associated with axis 1 and lots of green fluorescent protein associated with FAT4. Okay? Now, <coughs> sorry. So as I mentioned, right, what we're trying to understand is how do you get this asymmetric distribution, right? And one of the models that has been suggested to generate uh, this kind of polarity or uh, the segrega segregation of, of these uh, uh, proteins uh, is based on the idea of localized feedbacks, right? And the idea is basically the following. The idea is that in principle, if you look at cells that express both fat and axis, okay, you can have two types of complexes, either fat four axis one or axis one fat four, right? And a priori, there shouldn't be a, a bias towards one or the other, okay? Now, the idea of the localized feedback model is that there's some feedback so that, or if you have a feedback, so that complexes in one direction promote more complexes in the same direction and inhibit complexes in the opposite direction, that is sufficient to generate polarity. Okay, or in other words, right, if you have this combination of self-enhancing feedback and mutual inhibition between complexes, this can in principle take you from a no polarity situation to a high polarity situation where you have only one type of complex on each boundary, or mostly one type of complex, right? You have a strong bias to one type of complex. Now, the point is that this is a model, right? And we do not know or have any, uh, had any idea whether such feedbacks exist, okay? And if they exist, what could be the, the mechanism that drives this, this kind of uh, polarity? So, so the main questions that we ask is first of all, can we identify feedbacks that lead to polar distribution of fat for axis one complexes? Okay, and uh, can we say something about the mechanism that is associated with this? And since it's a synthetic system, we also wanted to see if we take cells that express both fat and axis, right? Do we see polarized distribution, um, or do we get this kind of planar cell polarity? Okay, so the first uh, let me start with the first question. So. The first question is trying to identify whether there, is lo uh, whether there are localized feedbacks. And um, so how do, you, how do you identify localized, uh, uh, a localized feedback or a positive feedback? You know, one of the hallmarks of a positive feedback is that you expect to get a kind of a threshold response. Meaning that if you look at a low concentration of, in this case, complexes, right, then you don't see too much uh, accumulation, but once you cross a certain threshold, the feedback kind of kicks in and you start getting lots and lots and lots of complexes. So, um, to, uh, okay, and, and uh, I also want to point out that, uh, in fact, our system allows us to separate the two types of feedback, right? For example, if, or in, in, you know, I will first talk about the, the self-enhancing feedback, if I have a co-culture situation where cell, one cell express only fat and the other express only daxes, then I would only have the self-enhancing feedback, right? So, so I'm looking at that uh, initially. So we wanted to see if we, we get this kind of threshold response, meaning that I expect that as I change the, the let's say, the level of daxes in the cell, I expect to see a kind of threshold response if we have a feedback, and I expect to see a linear response if we don't have feedback. Okay, so here's this experiment. Okay, the first experiment, very simple. We take a co-culture of cells, we add doxycycline, we wait different amount of times after adding doxycycline, and we look at the accumulation on boundaries. Okay, and so to get statistics on that, we take um, uh, this co-culture uh, experiments, we take lots and lots of cells, it looks very blurry uh, here. Uh, probably it's a, it's a little better in the uh, real images, but um, 
but the, the, the idea is that you take these images, the co-culture images, and you induce them for different amounts of times or different uh, 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 induction times. <coughs> Sorry. And, and you look what happens. And basically, what we developed this platform that analyzes these images, basically segmenting the cells, determining which cells is expressing FAT4, which cell is expressing DAX1, where is the red cells, where are the green cells, and where do we see accumulation on the boundary, right? And, and we can analyze and, and get some statistics on that. So one thing that we can do, we can look at the average population at each image, right? And see how the fraction of accumulating boundaries. So we have some boundaries where we see accumulation, and other boundaries where we don't. And, and when we look at the fraction of accumulating boundaries as a function of DAX is one, we see an increase with the induction as expected. It's somewhat nonlinear. Okay, it's described by a Hill function with Hill coefficient two. Um, it's a little bit nonlinear, uh, but again, this is a this is a population average. Um, to look a, li a little bit more carefully um, uh, at this, what we can do, we can basically look at each boundary, determine if we see accumulation or do not see accumulation in that boundary, and then ask what are what are what is the level of fluorescence in the cells flanking each boundary. Okay, so we, we do that by plotting a two-dimensional distribution plot where each point is a boundary. A yellow point is a boundary with accumulation, a purple point is a boundary without accumulation, and the axis are the level of fluorescence in the two flanking cells. And basically what you see is that all the boundaries that exhibit accumulation uh, are above a certain threshold both in FAT4 level and in DAXIS1 level, right? So basically, you see this in the, you see most of your um, boundaries here in the higher, highest uh, quadrant. Um, uh, and if we look at, wow, this is really blurry. If you're looking at uh, um, uh, different induction times, the, the main difference that you see is that the number of accumulating boundary increases, but they're all at that, uh, top right quadrant, right? Consistent with the idea that you need, need both high level of fat and high level of DAXs. Now the other thing that we can do is we can look at a single pair of cells as a function of time, right? And see what happens to the accumulation. For example, as we induce DAXs. Okay, and, and we do that using an assay that we developed in the lab, which is called a two cell assay. Okay, the, it's basically a micro patterning device that we do um, um, using the uh, nanocenter facilities. Thank you. And uh, the, uh, basically this device is, is uh, as you can see here, it's, it's an agarose layer which has holes that uh, the size of these holes is about 20 microns. Okay, it has a bow tie uh, shape so that it's suitable for about two cells. And these two cells are touching each other. Okay? And you know, if we uh, throw these two types of cells, the FAT4 and DAXIS1, basically what we see is um, we can take a, a movie where we induce the level of DAXIS1 at t equals zero and see what happens. And if you, we do that, and I hope you can see it, you will notice that you start getting accumulating at the boundary as you induce it. And if you analyze this um, more quantitatively, um, basically, you can see that the level of FAT4 stays constant. The le level of DAXIS1 slowly increases. This uh, slow start is actually um, comes from uh, uh, our inability to see the signal at a very low level. So we actually expect it to, to start from uh, more linearly. But if we look at what happens at the boundary, basically we see a very sharp jump at a certain time point, right? Again, consistent with this kind of idea of a threshold that occurs at a certain concentration. So um, kind of an intermediate summary is that what we identified is that you can have, you need both high levels of FAT4 and high levels of DAXIS1 to get strong accumulation on the boundary. Of course, the question is, what is the mechanism for that? So as I mentioned before, these uh, FAT4 and DAXIS1, these are uh, porto large portocoherence. Um, and we know from standard coherence, like E coherent and N coherent, that these coherence tends to, tend to uh, uh, 
cluster right, in a cooperative manner uh, at the boundary between cells. And we thought that this might be a mechanism also for this kind of localized feedback. Right? So to check that, <coughs> so, ah, so the idea is that if you have a low concentration of FAT4 and DICES1, then uh, this is not very stable and uh, you basically get um, no accumulation. However, if you have high enough concentration of FAT4 and DICES1, they form clusters which stabilize these complexes at the boundary. So to, to check this idea, we did an experiment where we, uh, we did an uh, experiment which is called FRAP, where we basically bleach a certain area here, actually half of the boundary, okay? And look what happens to the, uh, uh, to the proteins or how the, the fluorescence recovers, right? And the idea is that in, in this kind of FRAP experiment is that uh, if, this, if, if these uh, uh, proteins can move freely, right, then there will be fast recovery. However, if you have stable clusters, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to get, uh, I'm going to show this again. Uh, okay, you're not going to get recovery. And indeed, um, if we look at the chemograph of, of this movie, we basically see that the boundary here between the bleached area and the non-bleached area, okay, is pretty, uh, is pretty flat, right? So it's, we're talking about something that is very stable over tens of minutes, okay? Uh, if you compare that to what happens to unbound proteins, like the unbound FAT4 or unbound axis 1, and we can do that using a, a FRAP turf, which we do here, basically we can see that this, these unbound proteins are a lot faster, they recover within seconds, okay? So we're talking about a difference in recovery rate, okay, which is more than two orders of magnitude. So these complexes are super stable at the boundary. We can also uh, quantitate that and just looking at the um, uh, diffusion coefficient and also the, the exchange rate, which corresponds to the endocytosis rate here, um, basically you see, as expected, two orders of magnitude difference between the unbound FAT4 and axis 1 and the um, bound complex. So this is consistent with the ID that this kind of feedback is feedback through stabilization. Okay, so the second question that we wanted to ask is, can we observe spontaneous polarization in cells that express both FAT4 and axis 1, right? If I now express both of these proteins, do we see these proteins arranged in a way that um, are po in, in the way that, they're, they're, that uh, 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 mimics the, their behavior in, in, in vivo? Okay, and to do that, we generated a stable cell line that expressed both fat and axis, fat four and axis one. Okay, in, uh, and, and we looked at that. However, there is a, 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 a tiny problem, actually it's not so tiny, okay, that um, if you have cells that express both fat and axis, then it's not clear how you can identify whether you have polarized distribution or not. Right? Because basically if you have polarized polarization in one direction or a mixed population of complexes or complexes in the same direction, when you will look in the microscope due to the limit of optical resolution, you will not be able to identify uh, whether you're polarized or, or not. This is what you would expect. And this is what we expected. However, and here we had a little surprise that we saw something else. Okay, so when we looked more carefully with confocal, uh, uh, high resolution confocal imaging and also uh, in super resolution, we noticed something quite interesting. We noticed that, um, I don't know if you can see it very clearly here, is that the green fluorescence and red fluorescence on both sides are shifted with respect to each other by something between 100 to 200 nanometers. Now this is, um, this is not chromatic aberrations, okay, we can check that, you know, we have fiducials and so on. This is a real gap that we see between the fluorescence of these uh, two sides. Um, so we call this, um, rain, uh, uh, this effect the rainbow feature, okay, naturally because you tend to see these kind of rainbows. Okay, now we don't really know currently what uh, generate this kind of, um, this kind of gap. But one 
hypothesis that we can come up with is the idea that these coherence, which I already mentioned, they are very, very large. If they form these clusters in an extended form, right, then you expect that the distance between the two sides would be around 150 nanometers or so. Okay? Um, and th now this is quite surprising because then the distance between cells is much larger than you would expect from adherence junctions or tight junctions or regular jun junctions. Okay? However, we don't have proof for that. And also, I would say that now that we're looking more carefully at many of these boundaries, you see more complicated structures. So it's kind of an open question. Nevertheless, okay, this rainbow feature okay, can actually help us determine if we see polarization or do not see polarization, right? Because now we can look at each of these boundaries, each of these accumulation, and try to see if we see a rainbow. If we see a rainbow, meaning that we see, a, uh, we see polarity. If we don't see a rainbow, right, there is no polarity. And um, when, we do, when we look at the co-culture of cells that express both fat and axis, we see these accumulating boundaries. And when we look more carefully at these boundaries, we see rainbows. Okay? And generally, there is a few interesting observations that I can say. First is that typically, within each boundary, the rainbow is consistent along the whole boundary. Right? So I don't get domains or anything like that within each boundary. So this is consistent with this kind of mutual inhibition, right? because there's one type that takes over the other type. Okay? The other, <coughs> the other uh, uh, interesting thing that we notice is unlike what we see in vivo, where the, the asymmetric distribution is kind of consistent over many cells, right? It's, Kind of, it's always fat axis, fat axis, fat axis, and so on. Here, we actually seem to, to have a situation where uh, each boundary polarizes independently of other boundaries. Okay? So we seem to have kind of local polarity on each boundary. Now, um, okay, so what could be the difference? You know, one of the, the differences that we think uh, underlie this, this kind of uh, polarity, uh, local polarity, uh, or between the in vivo and the in vitro case is that in our cell culture system there's quite a bit of variability in expression between cells. So different cells express different levels of fat and different levels of DAXs. Right? So if you look at each of these, okay, so I'll, I'll do, wow. Uh, if you look at each of these boundaries, right, you can ask, is that cell expressing more DAXs than this cell? Or is that cell expressing more fat than this one? And does this kind of gradient on, from both sides of the, the boundary, does it determine the, the polarity? Um, uh, does it determine the polarity of the, the process? And so we did that. We analyzed these, uh, many of these images. And for example, here in this image, we, we labeled it this way, right? This, this um, dumbbell thing uh, actually represents the, the rainbow, right? The direction of polarity. Uh, these wedges, represent the gradient, meaning that this cell has higher DAXs than this one, this cell has higher fat than this one. Now in this situation that you see here, right, um, you have opposite gradients of DAXs and fats across the, the boundary, right, and the polarization seem to align with both of these gradients, meaning that you get higher level of DAXs on the side of the red um, high DAXs expressing cell and higher levels of fat on the boundary with, that expresses high, high level of fat. So this is a situation where the, the, the gradients and the polarity uh, seem, to, um, uh, uh, seem to align. So, and, and basically we can, um, we can analyze many of these boundaries and if we have the situation where we get opposite uh, gradients, like I showed you here, uh, turns out that almost always we get the situation where the polarity aligns with the two gradients. Okay, however, if you have a situation where the two gradients are in the same direction, for example, along this boundary, okay, then we see that about half of the times we get polarity in one way and about the other half the, in the other direction, right? And so it seems like in some cases it's controlled by the gradient of fat, and in other cases it's controlled by the gradient of taxes. Okay, so, so basically this is consistent with the idea that different levels of expression 
Okay, different. That's the last slide. Okay, different levels of expression are, are uh, can can uh, can bias the the polarity. And I want to say also that in real uh, in vivo systems, there are also gradients, long range gradients of the axis, and also, for example, in the wing of uh, a kinase that control the interaction between fat and axis, and that can bias the, the direction. So to conclude, basically, what I showed you today is that. Um, we study this kind of planar cell polarity process and how it can emerge from the interaction between FAT4 and DAXAS1 complexes and that uh, we bring evidence and also suggested mechanism for how these feedbacks uh, bring rise to, uh, or what are the underlying uh, localized feedbacks for, for this process. And also that uh, we can show that cells that express both FAT and DAXAS uh, can spontaneously polarize or can show uh, are sufficient to show uh, polarization. So uh, some of the things that we're following up on is, is looking at the dynamics of how this um, polarity emerges uh, or even how it is dissociated and what are the molecular mechanisms that underlie these, these rainbows. And this is my lab. <coughs> and as I mentioned, uh, Olga and Itze did most of the work, and there was also some uh, work done by Nadav, who was a master student, and Liat, my, my lab manager, and thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Uh, you, you, you could have imagined that the propagation of polarity in a new direction. Yeah. It would propagate due to the efficiency of whatever uh, material you, you, you have. Uh, if you created at one side one polarity, then the efficiency of this particular material will be expressed to maintain the same polarity on the other side. Yes, of the cell. so that's exactly... But for, that, but for that, you need sequential growth of cells, rather a well-prepared... If you want the wave to propagate in one direction, it would be good to grow uh, the cells sequentially, yeah. not to prepare a tissue uh, grown up at equivalent rate. So that's some... Um, yes, so I'll say two things about that. Uh, one is that um, you don't need to have the cells grow, right? You just need to uh, control the, the expression of these proteins, right? And the other thing that, okay, if you have in the model, right, uh, you can have, what you're saying is that if you have some sort of uh, 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 diffusion between the two sides of the cell, right, then you can have a situation where you have propagating wave of polarity that goes on. Uh, clearly, um, or this is not happening in our, our system, okay, and one of the reasons that it's not happening is that, you know, different cells turn on the axis, at, uh, one of the proteins at different times and different levels, so, so it's not. Uh, uh, so, if if you wanted to have something that is synchronized, then you would want maybe to have a kind of a gradient, right? Uh, that that is turning on, and then it starts on one side, and then it propagates, 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 and so on. This is what what you meant. This is the the idea of the model, right? And and however, as you can see here, if you if you have variability in the, in the expression, then then you're not going to get exactly that. Um, we're, we're, we're thinking about trying to impose a kind of an external gradient and see if we can, we can, we can get this kind of polarity. Yeah, okay, I think uh, we, we have time for the next speaker. Oh, thank you. Uh, oh, okay. yeah. uh, I was wondering if, if in vivo this says they obtain 3D structures or... Uh, yes, so okay. So maybe the extra dimension causes the... The gradient that you're looking for? No, it's, it's not. So, as I said, we're talking about epithelial cells, and these proteins accumulate on the apical surface, which is the top surface, on the perimeter of each cell, right? So it's really quasi, quasi 2, 2D. Uh, you have cells from below obtaining some kind of pressure, I guess. Well, for the epithelial cells, it's a pretty self-contained system, okay, because you have a basal membrane at the bottom. Oh, often, right. Okay. Let's thank David. Thank you.